This is part three of a series about the real possibility of life elsewhere in our solar system. In this video, I'll be giving an overview of the two planets and three ice moons we'll be looking at in more detail in later videos. What are ice moons? Keep watching to find out. We'll also look at how we might detect life at those places. What we've learned so far about liquid water, volcanism, and tough microbes gives us a realistic list of places to look in our solar system. It's important to have a short list because it will be hundreds of years before we've seriously studied every place in the solar system. Space missions take decades of planning and are extremely expensive, so we have to target the most likely places first. Our list is not long, but very interesting. It includes the same two planets that have long been considered as candidates for extraterrestrial life, although with very new ideas. Also on our list are three of Jupiter and Saturn's combined total of 125 ice moons. What are ice moons? They are, strange as it may sound, moons made mostly of ice. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. The cloud of gas from which our solar system formed contained lots of it, plus nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and the other relatively light elements. Starting with this set, it's easy to see how compounds such as water, ammonia, and methane would form. They comprised much of the primordial cloud's mass. A certain zone around the Sun is too hot for such compounds to exist as solids. In that zone, these substances are gases. Colliding rocks pass through and don't collect it. So this abundant material is not available to make planets in that region. That's why the planets in the inner solar system are small. At a distance slightly closer to the Sun than Jupiter's orbit, called the snow line, it's cool enough for these compounds to solidify. They form chunks which collide and get bigger as rocky particles do. Out past the snow line, ice is just another rock. A moon or planet is a mixture of heavy and light materials. Young worlds are also hot, often enough to completely melt the material. That's easy in the case of water. When a world is molten, heavy material sinks to its core with lighter stuff floating to the outside. The Earth and all rocky planets are like this. Most of the densest material, such as nickel and iron, and less common heavy elements, sunk to the core. Closer to the surface we get layers of lighter and lighter material. The process of forming these layers is called differentiation. Many ice moons are differentiated too. Those that are have an inner rocky layer surrounded by water. The rocky cores maintain some of their primordial heat, plus a few of these worlds experience a very important source of energy hardly noticeable on Earth. We measure distances to planets in astronomical units. 1 AU is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun, about 150 million kilometers. All the planets orbit the Sun in ellipses. Since the distances are not constant, we take the average. Jupiter is 5.2 AU from the Sun, while Saturn is 9.5 AU. It's very cold out there. At those distances, if we considered just the Sun's energy alone, we'd expect the ice moons to be frozen solid. They are not because of tidal heating. Jupiter is over 300 times the mass of the Earth. Saturn is 95 times. The strong gravity from such high masses distorts the Moon as they orbit particularly since elliptical orbits mean that moons are at times close to and other times further from their giant planets. This stretches and squashes the moons, creating friction, which translates into internal heat. The closer the moon is to its giant, the more tidal heating it gets. Io, the closest moon to Jupiter, is the most volcanic world in the solar system. Io experiences so much tidal forces that the moon practically boils from inside. 
Callisto is the most distant of Jupiter's large moons, so it gets the least tidal heating. It never got hot enough to have fully differentiated and it doesn't have clear internal layers. However, in between those two extremes, some ice moons experience enough tidal heating to maintain a layer of liquid water without being too hot. As most of these moons have very thin atmospheres, there's nothing to protect the surface from the cold of space. So the outer layers are frozen. Beneath the icy crusts are subsurface oceans much deeper than Earth's and always dark. The oceans are sandwiched between outer crusts of ice and volcanic bedrock below. Ganymede, the solar system's largest moon, almost certainly has such an ocean, maybe even several stacked in layers. Ganymede's magnetic field interacts with Jupiter's in a way that indicates the water is salty. Ganymede's distance from Jupiter probably means it experiences little tidal heating and volcanism. Most importantly, the, the seawater is probably not in contact with volcanic bedrock, meaning no increase in chemical complexity. Unfortunately, this may rule out Ganymede as a serious contender for life. Therefore, the ice moons of interest to us include Jupiter's Europa plus Saturn's Enceladus and Titan. Europa and Titan are each about the same size as Mercury or the Earth's moon, although Titan is considerably heavier. Enceladus is smaller but has the same basic structure as the others. As the moons orbit within the giant planet's highly radioactive magnetic fields, oxidizing substances here, meaning those that take electrons, build up upon the moon's surfaces. That material may enter the subsurface ocean via cracks in the ice. If the moon's rocky cores are indeed volcanic, the volcanoes would release hot water and ionized organic compounds into the water. The combination would create the electrical current we learned about earlier. Hence, there could be microbes living in the oceans of the ice moons, or in at least one case, possibly, something larger swimming around. We know where to look, but what should we look for? Since we would be unlikely to see most alien life directly, except with a microscope, we will instead have to search for the indicators of life, or biomarkers. There we have several options. We can take any light source, such as a star or a planet, and spread out its light into a rainbow. These rainbows are not continuous. They contain a mixture of dark and colored lines. Each line indicates the presence of, of a particular element. You can take ordinary substances, burn them in a flame, and they will always produce the same colors. The reasons are extremely complex, but for us, this fact means that we can know exactly which lines correspond to which elements in a light source. Thus, at any distance, we can work out what something is made of. We call this type of study spectroscopy. However, since living and non-living things use the same elements, the presence of any particular set doesn't tell us much. Yet, spectroscopy can indicate whether gases are being made on a world. If the world is a non-living system, gas ratios will eventually stabilize. Yet, if the observed amounts are out of balance with expected proportions, this may indicate life. For example, on Earth, oxygen, methane and nitrous oxide are products of life. If all life was suddenly wiped out, the Earth wouldn't hold those gases for more, for more than a few months. The fact of them being in our atmosphere indicates an active manufacturing process, life, and this may be true elsewhere too. More directly, we can look for the remains of organisms. Fossils are one example. They would be perfect proof of large creatures, but for microbes it's not so easy. Several non-living geochemical processes produce little balls which look a lot like fossil cells, so it can be very difficult to visually tell the difference. Also, fossils are pretty rare on Earth, and it would take a lot of searching before a space rover found suitable fossils on another world. 
a better way is to look for chemical fossils. A certain class of molecule called hopanes arises only from the breakdown of cell walls. No known non-living process can make them. Also, hopanes last for billions of years. If we found them in a rock, it would pretty much confirm the former presence of life. A further method is comparing isotope ratios. Isotopes are chemically identical versions of an element that have more or fewer neutrons in their, in their nuclei. Most elements naturally come in several different isotopic forms. For example, the three stable isotopes of carbon are carbon-12, carbon-13 and carbon-14. The numbers refer to the atomic number, which is the count of all protons and neutrons in the atom's nucleus. Carbon always has six protons. Isotopes of carbon can have six, seven or eight neutrons, depending on the atomic number. The natural proportion of carbon-12 to carbon-13 is almost 99 to 1, with trace amounts of carbon-14. Carbon-12 is the lightest. That's why the chemistry of living plants absorbs it from the air in preference to the, other, to the other isotopes. So plant cells, and any life forms that eat them, have an isotope ratio with even more carbon-12 than the normal non-living background ratio, or almost 100%. Something similar is true of other elements including sulfur, iron, nickel, and chromium. In each case, an isotope ratio different from the non-living norm strongly suggests living things. However, this principle is not perfectly reliable, and some non-living processes can also alter carbon's isotope ratio. Maybe the best biomarker concerns the shape of molecules. Certain complex molecules, such as nucleotides, the units of genetic information, and sugars, can be produced by non-living processes. These molecules exist even in deep space and do not necessarily indicate life. Yet fortunately, these molecules come in left or right-handed versions, which are not mirror images. The two versions have the same chemical formulae, but are not biologically interchangeable. Living things will always use just one version. A mixture of both left and right-handed forms of such molecules means a non-living process. However, when a sample contains just one type, as far as we know, that would be absolute proof of life. For that, we have to go out and collect samples. Spectroscopy won't help. Today, using these chemical tools, we can know for certain whether a sample is living, once living, or never living. So we can reliably detect life if it's out there. And we have several likely places to look. These are Mars and Venus, plus the ice moons, Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, click on the next video in the series. That's about the two planets in our solar system most likely to host life, Mars and Venus. Thanks for watching.